Okay, I'm here today with uh, Professor Bruce Rosen um, for the OHBM Oral History Initiative um, to celebrate 25 years of uh, OHBM uh, learning. So a big uh, event. Yeah, it is indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I'd like to start by asking about your background and how you became interested in neuroimaging. Um, somewhat by um, serendipity. Um, I was actually... Um, uh, working with the colleagues at what was then the MGH NMR Center, and you know, now we're at the Martino Center, um, working on various uh, technical issues. And a colleague of mine, a chemist, actually brought a problem to me. He was uh, developing contrast agents to look at the liver. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the game there was uh, to try to develop agents that would then get picked up uh, by the liver and would uh, you know, create contrast enhancement yeah. the way we would today with our gadolinium agents. Uh, yeah. uh, this was, of course, at the very dawn of MR uh, back uh, uh, in the uh, you know, early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so there wasn't that much known, and designing an agent that would be specifically taken up by the liver was considered an important thing. Mm -hmm. But they found that when they began to image, the very first images, rather than showing up bright, uh, which is what they were hoping for, just kind of like a standard contrast enhanced image, yeah. actually showed up dark. And then the images uh, subsequently brightened up. Uh, and so he said, you know, what's up with this? And, uh, you know, kind of set me to thinking about the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came up with a hypothesis that uh, when the agent was first being uh, introduced uh, into the blood, that uh, rather than kind of a relaxation effect, this thing that causes the images to enhance, actually the uh, uh, dominant contrast effect was a so-called susceptibility effect, mm -hmm. where there were differences uh, in the magnetic field induced locally around the blood vessels, uh, and that was uh, actually leading to the signal drop. And then uh, as the concentration of the blood vessel, you know, kind of uh, uh, you know, washed out, then you would get the kind of a relaxation effect. Um, but then it turned out uh, the way to test that, rather than explore it in the liver where this kind of washout happened very quickly, uh, again, a, uh, a, by a, just good luck, I had a young neurologist who was uh, doing uh, a research fellowship with us. His name was Arnold Villiger, also one of the uh, pioneers that we know. Um, he was looking for a project. He was doing kind of lactate imaging of the brain with me, but that project was going slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and so we hit upon the notion of studying the brain because the blood-brain barrier would keep the contrast agents kind of inside the blood vessels longer and allow us to explore the effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with Arno, we started out a series of experiments to actually show that it was this magnetic susceptibility mechanism, mm -hmm. um, which he showed, uh, you know, in what was, uh, you know, quite a, a well-cited paper at the time, which is, you know, kind of the first technique to measure a functional attribute of uh, the brain, yeah. in this case, you know, kind of the blood flow delivery, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which you couldn't see with this conventional T1 effects because the agents didn't leak out. Yeah. But in the normal brain, you saw this enhancement of this T2 effect, this susceptibility effect. And so that kind of started me, uh, you know, kind of introduced me to the notion of uh, the brain and perfusion and what the interest was. And then uh, after that paper was published, Arno went back to Germany, but we had a new grad student come into the group, and that was Jack Bellico. Yeah. Um, Jack was especially keen on studying brain function mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, introduced the notion that if you could uh, image uh, with this perfusion technique uh, multiple times, you could actually compare differences in brain state, much the way PET scanning had done previously with their uh, oxygen measurements. Yeah. Um, so um, when we then had uh, uh, the good fortune to have early access to very high-speed imaging, the so-called echoplanar uh, imaging, which at that time was not available on the commercial scanners, but there was a small company, again, serendipitously and fortunately started by my uh, former thesis advisor. Yeah. <laughs> so it was located in Boston. He worked for uh, Sir Peter Mansfield, who of course won the Nobel Prize for NMR and for discovering EPI. Mm -hmm. One, uh, two of their, his former grad students started this company, Advanced NMR, and when they were looking for a site to prototype this instrument, they cited it at our hospital. Uh, Jack uh, was saying, you know, let's do these experiments. Yeah. Um, and um, sure enough, uh, you know, with a little bit of trial and error and uh, learning along the way and with some help from Peter Fox, who shared with us the visual goggles that he used for his first pet experiments. Mm -hmm. We used literally the same goggles that he shipped up from Texas at that point to allow us to use. We were able to demonstrate uh, 
um, that we could show uh, visual uh, activation uh, with MR. And so that was the first fMRI experiment. Uh, it was, uh, you know, Jack's, uh, you know, kind of famous uh, cover of science uh, picture. And, uh, you know, the rest, uh, the rest was history. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that leads on to, to another question, um, which is about, you know, what, what contributions are you most proud of in your career? I mean, that, that clearly is good. That's to not a bad one. one. <laughs> That's not a bad one. You know, to be honest, um, I think uh, my greatest contribution was uh, just in uh, cheering on the fabulous, you know, people that I had the opportunity to work with. Yeah. You know, Arno and, and Jack, uh, uh, Dave uh, Kennedy, uh, uh, Robert Weisskopf at the time, uh, you know, others, uh, you know, subsequent to that, Peter Bandettini was in our lab, uh, um, uh, Randy Buckner was a fellow in our lab, Anders Dale was a fellow in our lab. So mm -hmm. a lot of the people that, you know, today are the, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, leaders of the field. Chantal Stern was another. Uh, many of them, you know, came through the lab kind of when we first made these discoveries. Ken Kwong, who of course did uh, these first bold experiments, was also, uh, you know, started as a fellow. So I think um, maybe the thing I'm proudest of is creating the environment where these really smart, you know, uh, you know, people could come and explore and kind of pursue their own passions. You know, Jack had a passion for studying the brain and um, you know my job was to just help create the environment where he can do his best work and turn him loose and of course yeah, then he did great things. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and what do you see happening with neuroimaging in the US uh, nowadays? It's actually, um, uh, it's, it's not like it's ever really lost its luster, but I think it's, it's gotten you know, yet another win, uh, right. largely because of uh, the U.S. Uh, Brain Initiative, yeah. um, you know, which is you know, somewhat similar to the efforts that are happening elsewhere around the world, in Europe, in China, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the U.S. effort um, you know, has been you know, focused kind of on the cells and circuits level, but mm -hmm. there is kind of increasingly an interest in human neuroscience, uh, and that's of course where the functional imaging, you know, really has, uh, you know, come to the fore because we're able to study humans in ways that, uh, you know, you can't, uh, um, um, uh, you know, uh, things that you can't do in rodents, uh, you know, to look at individual cells and look at individual circuits, you have to come up with non-invasive ways to study those principles in humans. Uh, and so the brain initiative in the U.S. has been, um, uh, quite generous in supporting uh, human neuroscience and neuroimaging, of course, is a very important part of that. So uh, that's led to a, an infusion of significant resources and technology, both in developing new instruments uh, and in developing new analytic methods. Uh, and of course, then that feeds into the more applications that people can use those tools to study all sorts of new things. Right, yeah. And do, you, do you see more convergence now between the findings from you know, circuits uh, in animal models and what we're getting from human neuroimaging? It's a, it's a super good question and something I've been, you know, thinking about. Uh, I would say that that convergence is kind of beginning. I mean, it's, right. um, there's certainly um, people that have begun to take the tools that were developed for, you know, kind of molecular, modern molecular, you know, neuroscience and apply them to, say, questions of the fundamental mechanisms of neurovascular coupling. And I yeah. think work of folks like Anna DeVore at UCSD, Beth Hillman at Columbia, really uh, David Boas now at BU, mm -hmm. you know, really have, uh, and others of course, you know, have really, uh, you know, kind of taken advantage of those uh, and made great efforts. Yeah. I think the, to me, even somewhat more interesting thing is when there's kind of a convergence in the scales that we can study. As neuroimaging continues to improve, in part because of these investments in the technology, I think we're going to be uh, able to move from kind of the systems level down to kind of the meso scale. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, at the same time, in animal models, the folks doing optical imaging uh, mm -hmm. uh, and electrophysiology are kind of going up. They're you know going from the arrays of the hundreds to arrays of thousands and tens of thousands, uh, from small optical field of view to you know whole kind of cortex. Mm -hmm. And they're also now uh, observing and uh, quantifying mesoscale phenomena. Yeah. So I have this notion that, uh, you know, kind of like uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, you know, started at both sides and they met somewhere in the middle, yeah. that, uh, you know, as the animal folks kind of build up from single cells to small local networks to kind of mesoscale phenomena, yeah. and as the human neuroimages can work their way down, that we're going to meet at this mesoscale. And then I'm hoping you know, what we're going to be able to learn and manipulate and study in animal models with optogenetics and all the rest of the modern tools will really inform what we can then see at the meso scale directly in humans, yeah. which then hopefully will allow us to, you know, better understand what we're seeing at a system level. Well, That's yeah. what I'm like looking forward to yeah, over yeah. the next five or ten years. Yeah.
Um, and so going to OHBM, you played a role in the creation of OHBM. Uh, what was that like during the early days? Uh, uh, it was a lot of fun, um, uh, a lot of uh, interesting characters, most of whom were new to me, right? Most of the uh, early, uh, uh, they were mostly fathers rather than mothers, uh, but uh, in that era, hopefully uh, that's changing. Um, but uh, you know, most of those founding fathers uh, came from the pet world, whereas of course those were the people that did functional imaging back, uh, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, folks like uh, uh, Jack and myself, uh, um, you know, were kind of newcomers with this new thing, you know, uh, MR. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I remember seeing uh, the, the slides recently at, at Jack's, uh, excuse me, at Peter Fox's, you know, first meeting uh, in Texas. You know, I wasn't there, but by the second meeting, I had somehow, you know, slipped in the door. And of course, that was shortly after Jack had published his paper and Ken had published uh, his paper. So now suddenly, the kind of old pet guard, if you will, was, uh, you know, paying a little attention to MR, although, you know, uh, somewhat skeptically and somewhat at a distance because they weren't tools they were familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so it was certainly fun in the beginning to get to know these people and they had a lot of interesting personalities and uh, uh, a lot of their own uh, perspectives on what uh, should or shouldn't be done. Um, but it was clear to us that MR was going to be the future and so we felt you know, that uh, we belonged in the room even if nobody else quite knew that at the time. Uh, and so uh, you know, after um, the organization of the very first meeting when the question came up, you know, who is going to take on the mantle and hold the second meeting? Yeah. Uh, that's when Jack actually <laughs> stood up and said, we'll do it. <laughs> and then everyone said, uh, great. And then, of course, he turned to Dave Kennedy and myself and said, okay, <laughs> now we have to do it. So <laughs> he kind of uh, agreed to it before we ever had much say in it. But uh, uh, in retrospect, I was very, uh, very glad uh, he did. And he had a very able partner in Dave who really did a lot of the heavy organizational lifting. Jack was kind of the inspirational uh, figure. Uh, Dave was the guy that could actually turn the inspiration into action. Uh, and I was there to, you know, to underwrite it and if we got into financial trouble, <laughs> somehow bail us out. So we each had a little role to play. And uh, in the end, that meeting, you know, took us from 800 some odd people to 1,200 people. It took the little budget that uh, the folks from Paris were able to share us and we handed off to the next meeting something like $150,000 so kind of put the whole basis uh, you know on a, on a firmer financial footing and although um, you know in the history books uh, uh, the third meeting is considered you know the first official HBM meeting actually the incorporation of the OHBM under that name actually happened to support the Boston meeting. We needed to create a, a corporation for that. So it actually was incorporated uh, just prior to uh, the Boston meeting and those articles of incorporation actually were used for several years before you know, we then created an, another uh, purpose-built group. So it was, it was a fun time and it was uh, you know, exciting for us as still as kind of the new kids on the block to uh, play a role, uh, you know, uh, having people you know, come to us. And um, that was probably the meeting where that shift a focus from away from PET and into MR really mm -hmm. became clear. I think the first meeting, they said, you know, kind of 25% of the meeting was uh, was MR. Uh, by our, by the Boston meeting, it was probably already up to half. And of course, subsequent meetings, you know, that grew tremendously. So mm -hmm. we again got in kind of on the ground floor of that game. Right. And and are, are there particular memories that stand out from your your time attending the annual meetings? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> I, I remember the Paris meeting, uh, you know, extremely well. Uh, there was just, uh, you know, again, for me, it was just uh, like a kid in a candy shop. I was just learning so much. It was largely unfamiliar uh, to me. And so, you know, almost everything I was seeing, you know, was new. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the people I were meeting you know, were also largely new. And so that was just a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. And I think the Rolling Stones were in town uh, for that meeting as well, if I recalled properly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember going to that meet <laughs> to that show, yeah, yeah. and that was a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, that, that first meeting was great. Of course, Boston was... Uh, you know, it, it was a whole different thing because we were uh, in the spotlight, and it's one of those things uh, uh, that you know, in the in the beginning, and the days building up to it, and the first day, you're just very, very tense and very, very focused. But as the meeting went on, it was clear that somehow we had managed to pull this off, and yeah, yeah. we found uh, you know the pins for the posters uh, at the last <laughs> second, and everybody could get them up, and people were enjoying themselves. Uh, we began to relax, and 
I remember we had a, a band play, a ska band uh, by the name of Bin Scalabim was our kind of party, and uh, to my mind, still the best uh, you know musical uh, event of uh, <laughs> the history. It was a lot of fun. People danced uh, very late. We actually paid them to play an extra set. People were just having a great time. Yeah. So that was good. And of course, each of the subsequent meetings, as the meeting grew, uh, you know, more more fun, more new people, uh, yeah. uh, a lot of great stuff. Yeah. And, and how do you see um, OHBM as having changed over the years? Uh, you know, how, do, how do you see it different uh, today? Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. I'll have to admit it's been a few years since I attended uh, before this meeting, so I was somewhat out of touch and uh, for, for various uh, reasons had missed this meeting, so I was anxious to see myself what it was like. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really migrated uh, into a very interesting and unique niche as I see it. Um, for a while, um, there was a time when I think it was somewhat overlapping with uh, uh, groups like the ISMRM, the big MR meeting, because yeah. it was kind of so much focus on fMRI. It was a new thing and the technology around that, and both organizations were pushing that. Mm -hmm. But over time, the ISMRM is you know, kind of more and more focused on kind of the hardware and technology for the pure acquisition. Mm -hmm. And it's clear from this meeting that people here are really thinking about how to analyze the data. Yeah. Uh, network analysis, very sophisticated mathematics and in, 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 uh, analyzing and interpreting what we're seeing in terms mm -hmm. of actually underlying uh, brain function. Uh, and that's something that's outside the scope of uh, other meetings, much more detailed than you'll see at neuroscience where you may get little smatterings of that, yeah. but you know, in a sea of other things that you'd miss. And uh, you know, much more focused on the analytic side than you'll see at a meeting like the ISMRM. So yeah. I think um, that to me has been both very exciting. I think some of the best sessions at this meeting are people that are doing just very creative things with how they're thinking about the data. And of course that then filters back into how you collect the data in, in, in lots of novel ways that I think will continue to you know, push uh, you know, both societies and the field forward uh, as a whole. Yeah, and, um, and the last question which follows on from that is where, where do you see the kind of future of neuroimaging then over the next five or ten years? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, um, uh, I absolutely don't have a crystal ball uh, on that. Um, it's clear the technology is not done growing, right? Uh, even MR, uh, which is a mature technology, uh, you know, continues to improve. Uh, mm -hmm. um, people are now talking about that uh, we have, I think, the first of our 11.7 Tesla magnets coming online. People are already planning on 14 Tesla human magnets, mm -hmm. so big magnets. I think that's one direction. Um, I think uh, other uh, tools, uh, optical imaging is now, of, of course, it has been used, uh, you know, uh, for quite some time, but those tools are really getting much better quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, things like MEG are, is about to undergo a dramatic improvement with the advances in atomic magnetometers, exactly. Mm -hmm. PET probably has uh, at least an order of magnitude improvement in sensitivity, uh, you know, awaiting it over the next uh, three or five years based on uh, novelty and crystal designs and geometries uh, and the application of deep learning to the reconstructions. Yeah. Uh, and I think that will take us to an area, at least I'd like to think, where we'll have a little bit of swing back to, you know, the, the, the old pet days. Right. You know, in many ways, uh, the society moved almost completely away from pet. Yeah, yeah. But I think especially in this setting of neuromodulation, which was a very hot topic at this meeting mm -hmm. from the analytic side, I think with the modern generation of PET cameras, we can anticipate people will be able to directly measure these neuromodulatory effects yeah. dynamically in vivo. I think that's going to be extremely yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, and again, kind of help you know connect the dots uh, you know between the different modalities. So um, you know uh, we've been kind of keen on this multimodal you know drum uh, banging on it. Obviously, mm -hmm. this uh, society has been uh, you know uh, foundational in, in helping that. And I see many of the other tools that complement them are really coming up to, yeah. to play uh, an even more active and, uh, you know, more engaged, uh, you know, role, uh, you know, less kind of niche supporting players and more kind of central to understanding what the brain's doing. Yeah, there, there have been a few interesting talks uh, that I've seen already on simultaneous PET MR mm -hmm. and how you can actually use that to get something that's, that's more than just... We're, we're, ex individual. we're extremely keen on that. Uh, you know, for example, you know, people have uh, made, you know, studies of receptor binding with PET for yeah. a long time, but it turns out if you simultaneously can measure function with MR and the uh, receptor dynamics, you can measure things like receptor 
uh, trafficking, um, a receptor internalization, uh, um, uh, you know, baseline receptor occupancy, these kind of quantitative measures that are actually very hard to make, mm -hmm. even in animal models, and now we can make them uh, in humans, and with increased sensitivity, I think, really be able to make those studies dynamically. Yeah. Um, so that's certainly something that we're very interested in, and uh, uh, it's, again, one of these domains where I think uh, the pet community uh, and the MR community really have a lot to learn from each other and a lot of fun to have together. Yeah, so it's an exciting future then. So Absolutely. That's been fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, for My pleasure, of course.